Well, good morning and, and welcome everybody to the Open SUNY National Distance Learning Week webinar series. We'd like for you to take a moment and let us know where you're from in the chat. It gives us a sense of where everyone is located, maybe uh, your role on your campus. That would be great. Also, your microphones are muted during the presentation, but they will be unmuted um, during the Q&A. So you can feel free to use your mic or type in the chat to ask our presenter any questions that you might have. You can also type in the chat during the presentation and I will be sure to field those questions at the end. National Distance Learning Week is celebrated annually to generate a greater awareness and appreciation for distance learning while recognizing leaders like Jennifer and best practices in the field. We aim to showcase the expertise of professionals engaged in the day-to-day -day practice of distance learning. My name is Erin Maney. I am the Manager of Communications and Community Engagement at Open SUNY. On behalf of the Open SUNY team, I would like to welcome you to this showcase webinar as part of National Distance Learning Week. And Jennifer, if you could advance the slide, I want to uh, I want to introduce our speaker to you today. We're pleased to host Jennifer Austin from the State University at Buffalo, who will be sharing about her Ready to Teach model for online programs. Jennifer Austin is the academic advisor for the Department of Counseling, School and Educational Psychology at the University of Buffalo. She's been working on instructional design projects for the Graduate School of Education since 2006, including a counseling minor. She is also a PhD student in the Curriculum, Instruction, and the Science of Learning online program at UB with a research focus on successful models for online learning design. On behalf of the SUNY team, we thank you all for joining us today and Jennifer for sharing what you know. Thank you, Erin. I appreciate you setting up and coordinating all of these events this week. Um, so I'm going to jump right in and uh, start talking to you a little bit about um, our counseling minor. Um, that launched in the fall of 2014 and um, how we did that. Um, we got a directive in the summer of 2014 uh, to roll out a newly approved minor for the fall 2014, which was a year earlier than we were initially planning. And then they said, by the way, uh, beyond adjuncts, uh, there's no budget to do this. So we jumped in uh, and uh, we had the minor. Um, the minor is a pre-professional sequence of courses in the counseling field. Um, so students in this program aren't going to be certified or, or licensed to counsel, um, but they'll be prepared to undergraduate uh, level work in the counseling field. Um, so it's a new minor for us. Um, it includes 18 credits. They need to have a general psychology prerequisite um, and then uh, nine credits of required courses that all of the minors take, and then six credits or two courses that they can choose from a variety of electives. Um, when we launched the minor, um, the courses you see in red are the ones that still needed to be developed, and uh, the ones in purple were the ones that we had already uh, been working on and had revised. So we started with a new course development model for us and I called it R2T or Ready to Teach. Um, the goal was to develop a scalable model. Um, we knew we had a lot of demand for the courses that we were going to be offering, um, but with uh, the limited um, number of faculty involved and our need to provide um, teaching experiences for our PhD students, we knew we were going to have a lot of uh, rotating uh, instructors through these courses and needed to find a way to provide some consistency in these courses um, across semesters between instructors. And so our R2T or Ready to Teach model was born. Um, how that worked was we found a lead instructor. Um, I then worked with the lead instructor and we collaborated together on an online course development. Um, we then had the lead instructor pilot the course, usually in the summer if that was possible. Um, we then made revisions to the course. And then um, the lead instructor would teach and mentor PhD students or new adjuncts in the delivery of the course. And we'd start the iterative process of making revisions to the course and bringing new faculty and new adjuncts into this teaching model for these courses. 
So what was our R2T? Um, it was a ready to teach course. So some of the hallmarks of the R2T was they had a ready to teach syllabus available. Um, and it's a detailed online syllabus um, for them, um, typically 12 to 16 pages and had all of the information um, that they would need and the students would need to take the course. So a lot more detailed than our typical um, on-campus syllabus would be. They also, um, number two was they had a ready to teach course. Um, so um, UB Learns is our branded Blackboard platform. So uh, the instructors for the course would have um, their course set up inside UB Learns and ready to go with them, um, including all the unit coursework, the discussion boards were set up for them. There was help content for students um, to get going with the course. There were um, announcements that were built in to the course. And then the instructors could um, customize um, from there what they needed to, but it gave them a good base start um, to be ready to jump in and teach that course. Um, it was made available to the students uh, four weeks in advance of the start of the semester. And we found that really um, gave students a chance to, to go into the content, take a look, get comfortable with the course in um, advance of the semester, and be ready to go when that semester started. Um, the Ready to Teach um, courses also followed a six unit schedule. Um, so when we looked at when we we're going to be teaching the courses, um, we noticed a lot of things ran on a six week or a three week schedule. Um, so we did a little bit of modification to our standard 15 week course schedule and bundled the content from the 15 week course down into six modules, um, usually do every other week throughout the semester. Um, when the course is offered in the summer, um, it just runs one unit's due per week. When it runs in a three-week winter session, two units per week are due. Um, but the, during the 15-week semester, it gives us some time at the beginning of the semester um, when we're still in the drop ad period to have students who are coming in and out of the course to not feel behind. Um, at the very end is a wrap-up unit and that usually happens during finals week. So students for the courses have already submitted their final projects before we get to finals week, which kind of frees them up to concentrate on some of the campus courses they're working on and gives our instructors time to grade and get those turned around um, for the end of the grading period. So the R2T courses typically follow a six unit schedule. Um, the R2T was also built um, with a dual mentoring system. So we knew we were going to have to offer lots of sections of these courses and that we didn't have enough adjuncts or experienced instructors um, to teach all of those sections. And so in the dual mentoring system, when a new instructor is teaching, um, they will be paired with an experienced instructor and um, the instructional designer who can help answer questions for them. Um, and that's worked really well for us. Another thing that's worked really well as part of the R2T model as we uh, do a multi-instructor best of revisions each semester. Um, so typically as the instructional designer, I would keep um, a copy of the syllabus um, in a binder and have it ready anytime any of the instructors who were teaching the course, there might be six or seven sections. Um, anytime they had a comment about something that uh, a student had a question on, something that needed clarification, um, something they would see change for the next semester, I was able to document all of those. And then at the end of the semester, before we offered the course in the following semester, we were able to review all of those suggestions and decide which were going to be implemented into the course. And it really helped to strengthen the course that cut down on the number of questions that students were asking um, because you know the instructions 
through the syllabus and through the course were very clear. So instructors could focus on implementing the course and providing feedback to students rather than answering a lot of email questions about the, the assignments or syllabus from the students. Um, and the other hallmark of our RGT model was uh, it's scalable because there's a course that's built and ready to go. Let's talk a little more about that. Um, when we launched the counseling minor back in the fall of 2014, it was a year earlier than we had previously planned. Um, but our target uh, for enrollment in the counseling minor in 2014, 15 school year was 35 students. And we actually exceeded that enrollment in the September to December 2014 frame, um, which led us to double our projection for the following year. And you can see we expected, you know, 70 students or so to enroll in that second year of the program. And we had over 200, um, again, over 200 in 2016 and over the 250 mark in 2017 as far as applicants to the program. Um, we uh, did that in part because the work on the courses really started back in 2012. So we were already building our market um, for the minor and we're, we're building interest and student interest in the courses that we were offering as part of the minor. So we rolled out two new courses in the fall of 2012. Um, we had 100 seats available. We filled 93. Um, we rolled out two additional courses for the fall 2013. Um, we offered seven total sections, um, greatly increasing our number of seats. We went from 100 to 355 this, in fall 2013. And, uh, filled a good chunk of those, 96.7% of those seats were filled. Um, in fall 2014, when we went to launch the minor, we rolled out three additional courses that year and uh, continued to build our enrollment. Um, we grew enrollment from fall 2012 to 2014 by 655%. So we knew we were in good shape to get lots of minors when we actually went to launch the program. Um, enrollment continued to grow into fall 2015, um, adding another 250 or so seats. And that's continued um, fall 2016. Um, we had our eight courses rolled out um, and uh, filled actually more seats than we had available. Added another course for fall 17, added more seats, filled 99% of those. And for fall 2011, we're up to 11 different courses with 38 sections, enrolling over 1,051 students. So we're able to grow enrollment even from the fall 2014 by 173%, but over a thousand times since we uh, started working on the initiative back in fall 2012. So in part how we scaled that was using a mentored teacher model. Um, we have a course, um, Dr. Michelle Shanahan um, teaches at, at CEP 594. It's a lab called Practicum and Teaching. Um, about that time, we also had a change in policy at UB that graduate students could no longer teach graduate students. And so um, it worked out well because we also needed to find undergraduate courses for our, our PhD counselor education students. Um, to teach, as well as some of the counseling psychology PhD students and educational psychology PhD students. Um, so they're mentored um, by the CEP 594 instructor, Dr. Shanahan, um, and they're assigned to TA with one of the current instructors. And they work with me as the instructional designer to um, learn about the course and uh, start to teach parts of it and start to have responsibilities in teaching that. Um, it really helped us build the bank of qualified experienced instructors that's let us scale the program. It's uh, a win-win. Uh, the PhD students get experience teaching online. Um, 
they get to focus more on the course delivery and the student interaction aspects of teaching the course rather than building the course. Um, so they really have a good model for online course design and delivery. Um, they've got great course evaluations, um, which has, have been a good CV builder. A lot of our instructors have gone on um, to take faculty positions um, at other institutions. Um, the other benefit is that once our students are teaching the courses, they're hired as adjuncts and they became members of UUP um, and they started to get benefits like health insurance, retirement, um, UUP tuition waivers, and until just this year, um, taking that route, teaching the two courses, um, made them more than a GA position would have made in our department. Um, so that was very helpful, especially because our counseling education students are typically working full time and unable to participate in a GA ship. The courses also um, have been very productive. Um, so we have a productivity index. Um, the undergraduate courses have a 0.7 weighting in GSE at the Graduate School of Education. Um, but the online undergraduate courses still make up 15 of the top 25 courses offered in, in the entire school, not just our department, but um, with four other departments. Um, of the top 25 courses by productivity index across the whole school, 60% of them are the CSCP online undergraduate courses. So they're very popular. Um, you know, 80% of those top 25 courses are online. And uh, by the 2015-16 school year, the counseling minor program uh, had the largest enrollment in GSE. Um, we had to get it rolling uh, with uh, no cost marketing. <laughs> As uh, like to call it, we had uh, no additional budget beyond um, the adjuncts to teach the course. So we had to get a little creative about how we found students and let them know about this brand new program. Um, counseling minors aren't something that are typically offer. I think it's still the only counseling minor SUNY wide. Um, so it's not something that students necessarily are looking for when they come into school. Um, but we've been able to build our market to start the minor and part of that was starting our marketing before the start of the minor um, as far as individual courses went. Um, we built um, good quality courses and they grew quickly uh, word of mouth um, student to student. Um, once we la launched the minor we also added a blurb about the minor into all of the CSCP undergraduate syllabi. So any student who was taking one of our courses, whether they're in the minor or not, was able to learn more about the minor option that was available to them. Um, we also, I did some stakeouts outside of uh, courses that were prerequisite courses for the program, namely Psychology 101. Um, so students in Psych 101 would frequently see flyers about the counseling minor and uh, be able to get more information about it that way. Um, I was also to email about the courses that we had to offer to students and, and majors that would be interested in those types of courses. Um, students were also emailed invitations to join the minor when they successfully completed one of our undergraduate courses. And uh, that worked really well. Um, I think they really appreciated having a personal reach out to them and seemed excited that they're being tapped to, to join the counseling minor. Um, we also built into some of the programs an extra credit for a video review of the course um, that they had taken, um, if the student shared that on social media. And having um, those student testimonials um, was very helpful. Um, they weren't uh, guided in any way. They shared good and bad things about the courses, um, what the students would really need to know and be ready to do to be successful in an online class. And they were candid about that. 
Um, but that uh, worked out really well for us. Um, we also did some no-cost marketing as part of course assignments. So, in our first course, um, typically the students take the CEP 200 Intro to the Counseling Professions. One of the assignments is a positive thought poster. And so um, students are learning how uh, positive thoughts impact uh, their feelings and uh, they make their own positive thought poster that they share on campus um, and they were citing uh, the uh, CEP 202 course and our link to learn more about the program and so uh, as part of the assignment students had to post uh, five or more posters um, with those positive thoughts and some of them they had to monitor um, but mostly they chose to, to post those those posters right on campus so, um, you know, like our second year, we had about 140 students registered for that course. And uh, those students uh, posted approximately 700 posters around campus. Um, and they've been a big hit around campus, um, get a lot of positive feedback about that, um, but has also highlighted our program in a no cost way. Um, the assignment is due strategically just before registration starts. Um, it does generate a lot of buzz and it coordinates very well with their unit on how thoughts affect mood and uh, students really like to do the assignment and to post the posters and to talk about the class um, with people who ask them about it. Um, we focus very heavily on creating a positive experience um, for students and found that the positive student experience really does drive future enrollment. Um, these are some of the comments um, that we've had from students about the courses, you know, from very effective, um, hands down one of the best professors I've had so far in college, and that's of an online instructor. Highly recommending the instructors, sent out reminders, they're clearly talking, communicating well with the students, um, they're passionate about their topic area, and uh, they liked that the student, the instructors had time to get to know students, in part because it was because of our R2T model. Um, the instructors were implementing the courses rather than designing them themselves during that window. Um, and course evaluations also um, show that the students were uh, really liking the courses and they, they were rating them pretty high. Um, the counseling minor is the dark blue line in each category on uh, the left-hand side. Um, the light blue line was our department average. The orange line was our school average and the gray line was our university average. And so you can see for each of these uh, parts of the course evaluation, the students were rating the online undergraduate counseling minor courses higher than other courses in the school or department. Um, and that's in the overall course. Um, they're rating it higher in intellectual challenge and learned subject matter. And they're rating the overall instructor higher on average. Um, the students are also successfully completing the courses. And that's one of the things I'm very excited about. Um, you know, we looked at some of of the data and the research that's been done on uh, success rates um, in completion of courses. And, you know, we're looking at articles um, back from 2007 when they were finding four institutions who had an 85% or higher completion rate for online courses. And those were highlighted. Um, you know, we're looking at the research from 2011 that the rate of failing or withdrawing is higher for online students than face-to-face -face courses. And uh, looked at the 2013 study um, that put online course completion rates at about 65%. Um, and so we really wanted to, to make sure that we were doing better than that. We needed to, um, to make sure more of our students were successfully completing. And then when we looked at the data, we found that they, they actually were 
um, so that students are successfully completing the courses in the counseling minor um, at a much higher rate than we expected. Um, this is a snapshot from the student outcomes in the counseling minor from fall 2017 at the end of the semester. Um, we had 93.06% uh, successfully complete with a C or better. Um, just 1.27% earned a D. Um, just under 5% earned an F or an FX for not attending. Less than 1% resigned or withdrew from the courses. And just over 1% um, got incompletes. Um, so we are really pleased to see that um, even though students rated the courses as more of an intellectual challenge than some of the other courses they were taking on campus, they also were able to successfully complete um, the online courses. And um, when we asked students about that, um, some of the things they talked about were um, the two week um, unit cycle. So having six units per semester with multiple weeks per unit um, let them be more flexible about when they could complete that work. And um, that was very helpful for students. Um, it helped us attract a lot of non-traditional students to the courses, as well as student athletes, as well as um, students who may be coming back to complete their degrees. Um, but it also let us attract a whole bunch of, of counseling minors. Um, who really did well with that content. Um, and so one of the things we wanted to do in starting the minor was to boost our graduate enrollment. And so um, spring to summer, spring 15 to summer 2018, we had approximately 495 students through the counseling minor. Um, 5.5% uh, enrolled in a department program, either in a rehabilitation counseling, school counseling, or school psychology program. But we found 8.5% enrolled in the Graduate School of Education and some other related programs like teacher education or student affairs. Um, we think we should almost be getting commission from our UB social work program because 8.7% uh, of our counseling minors have actually gone on to enroll in a social work program. Um, another percentage in the audiology program, nursing programs, and just other UB programs in general. Um, and we've really been able to get a cream of the crop there. Um, the UB graduate school enrollees had an overall median GPA of 3.57, which in some of our programs was above the program average. So the program overall has been a win-win-win. Um, the department has uh, a new program generating revenues for them. Um, we had 182 uh, current students at the year, start of the fifth year of the program, but have conferred over 675 uh, minors in the first four years of the program, and more than 1,000 enrollments each fall and spring semesters. Um, plus, we're getting enrollment in both the winter and summer semesters. Um, students, I think, are winning here too because they're getting a high quality online learning experience every time um, using content experts and instructional designers to create engaging online courses. And they're also learning and using the minor to learn about viable career options. And it's a win also, I believe, for our PhD students and new faculty. Um, because they're learning to teach online using a mentored model, they're gaining feedback and online teaching experience um, and getting a paycheck to boot. And some references and questions. Thank you so much, Jennifer. There are a couple questions in the chat. So with uh, just a minute or two left, I will read them to you. So the first question uh, was whether or not you had any tenured faculty teaching the RTT online courses in the counseling minor. And a second part to that question was, was there any pushback from instructors about having to teach from a master course that was already created for them or did they appreciate it? Um, we did not, we've had um, typically not 
uh, full-time faculty teaching those courses, um, but there's been a full-time faculty member who's reviewed the courses um, for quality. Um, for the most part, the, the teachers have really appreciated having the courses, um, especially as new instructors, um, typically. Um, there really hasn't been a lot of pushback on using a master course and instructors would still have the flexibility to make changes to that course. Thank you. And Holly is asking if you could give a range for your class sizes. So in looking at the math, um, there were two sections with 100 enrollments, which is about a class size of 50 and 38 sections with over 1000 enrollments about an average of 27. So what's like the range of class sizes? Our class size has uh, bumped around um, during the last five years. Um, we're, we're on our third dean in, in, the, in the window that we're talking about here. Um, so class sizes have varied anywhere from 50. Um, they went then to 35 per class. They then went to 40 per section. They then went to 24 per section. Um, and they're currently at 30 per section. Um, so we've bounced around in that and, and we've had to make uh, changes to our courses um, to accommodate those different types of class sizes. So as class sizes gone, went up, we had to change some of the things that were interactive in the course, um, maybe fewer discussion boards, um, maybe group presentations instead of individual presentations to try to keep that instructional time approximately the same for the adjuncts that we're teaching for us. So you just mentioned some instructional challenges that come with that. Have you faced any particular challenges with support for online students, such as Genius asking student services, academic supports, anything like that? Um, actually, the, the interaction that support staff have with the minors is very minor. Um, we've made the, the content for the minor very transparent and right up front. Um, when students apply, they get a little guide to the minor. Um, and typically that takes care of 99% of the questions that they have. Um, so it didn't raise our need for support a ton, um, much less than other programs that we were running. Thank you. Those are all of the questions that are um, in the chat. And since, um, since we are at time, I will go ahead and just wrap us up. A lot of thank yous for you. So I appreciate, Jeannie, you sharing what you know with us and sharing your model, your program. Um, I love the questions. They were varied and um, from different angles. So we have a lot of people on the call who are either faculty or support um, professionals. So that's a great kind of mix. So it was nice for them um, to be able to hear that from all those angles. So we appreciate your time and attention. For those of you that joined us on the call, I did post a link to the recording um, or to where you can access the recording uh, by the end of the day. And there are other events happening for National Distance Learning Week. So we would encourage you to take a look at those. And we hope to see you at another online event soon. Take care and have a great day. Thank you, everyone.